I know. <laughs> I've just realized where we are. Uh, where we are located in Liverpool, you will not believe the name of the neighborhood. Longview. I've just realized where I am. <laughs> I'm in the American version of Longview, but our Longview is in one of the worst neighborhoods in Great Britain and in the top 10% worst neighborhoods in Europe. So, <laughs> me off. There you go. They're messing with me now. <laughs> Did I offend you by, uh, <laughs> by talking about the media people? <laughs> so, <laughs> she's going to mess with me now for the next half an hour. So, it was, it's interesting. As my wife was saying, yes, it's a privilege, but we are in one of the tough areas in Great Britain. But isn't God wonderful for those that are lost, that he would put an apostolic preacher in the middle of a very hurt neighborhood with an absolute neighborhood that the people are broken, given to drug addictions, to mess. Are you all right, okay? I don't even need a mic, to be honest with you, so i got a big enough mouth. So anyway, I will continue. I will endeavor. Thank you, media team. You're doing a great job over there. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you would stand with us this evening, just in respect of the Word of God. We're going to read from the book of Genesis, verse 20, chapter 28, starting at verse 10. And you're in King James. Okay, thank you. It says, And Jacob went out from Bathsheba and went towards Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set upon the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and of, uh, the God of Isaac. The land wherein you liest to you I will give it. And to thy seed and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And they shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee. And will keep thee in all places whether you goest, and I will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! How awesome this place is. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Father, before we take our seats, if you could lift up your heart once more in the house of God, lift up your voice, and lift up your, your hands and in surrender to the Word, that God... I ask you tonight to use this vessel of clay, these lips of clay, this tongue of clay to minister to these precious people, Father, as we give you the honor, as we give you the praise, the reverence, and the respect that you so much deserve from your creation. So we love you, and we thank you, and we give honor and praise to you, Jesus. And the congregation says together, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing in respect and reverence of the Word of God. I want to continue from that point there in verse 18. And it says, And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar. The strongest point of any building is the pillar that everything is built around. And he said he used this for a pillow, but he turned it into a pillar. And he poured oil upon the top of it, pouring oil upon it. The, the, the symbolic uh, of, of oil is the Holy Ghost. You're going to get where I'm going in two more minutes. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and I will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace. And then the Lord shall be my God and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and of all that thou shalt give me I will surely give the tenth unto thee. 
This was the man, if you put your picture in the right context, he was on the run from his brother. The man was going to be murdered, killed by his own kin because he was a right little piece of work. He stole from his brother. He took his birthright. He, he can't demand of that one. And then he took the blessing of the oldest son. And his mother was involved in it. And when he took the blessing, he found out when his older brother, his brother came in, woo, that brother that was not a happy Esau at all, come after him to kill him. So this is not a good picture, really. He's on the run in fear. So when you see that, you only see that this man took all the time, stole, he, he, he took it. We would have probably liked Esau better than Jacob. Because this little crafty one here, they call him the supplanter, he was always on the take. But now he's on the run. Now he's in a situation where God can deal with him. He's got a problem and he's lying fast asleep. I've never slept on a rock. But somehow this man did. And I'm looking at what he said. When he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he said, I was afraid I was in, in absolute awe. And he said, this is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate to heaven. Every single time you come into the congregation, into church, like tonight or even... Sunday when you're coming this week. Remember this, that God is watching. He said that the Lord was overviewing what was happening down below. And the Lord was sending angels and they were ascending and descending, coming in to where he was, taking from him and, and then delivering things to him. And he said, I didn't even know that God was in the place. We have to be very careful as the church because this is the house of God. And here is the gate to heaven. What we have in here this evening are the angels as God is overseeing what we are doing. We are worshipping Him, but the angels are still ascending and descending into this building. They are bringing healing. They are bringing the blessings of God as we would cast upon Him all things that He knows that we cannot carry. The angels are going up and down, but we tend to forget just like Jacob realized. He said, I, I, I didn't even know that this was where God would be. He said it. And he said, and this is the gate to heaven. If you've come into this building this evening with an issue or any problems, any disease in your body, anything that you need, the angels of heaven are ascending and descending into this house. God is overseeing everything that we are doing in here. Don't ever forget when you come to the building that God is viewing what we are doing. And he is sending the angels of heaven into this place. Mm. So every time you come together, walk in and go, God's in this house. And this is the gate to heaven. And what I need from God, I can open my heart to him and he can deliver it. And whatever I need to give back unto him, any burden, any issues, any sorrow, any pain, whatever I've got to give, this is where we have it happen. So what I want to show you is this, and this is really, this gets better. He had a weakness, and God turned his weakness into a strength. He turned his pillow into a pillar. He took what he was sleeping on and created such a strong place in his life that the weakness became his strength. Can I come down there, Pastor? We're going to jump. I'm I fell off a ladder three weeks ago. I'm walking down the stairs. <laughs> I am. Are you all right over here? There you go. So what I did years back, and I began to look at this scripture, and I'm still, it fascinates me. Over the years that God took me, what I was sleeping on, when I was having a pillow at the church, God began to bring me to these places where he wanted to strengthen my walk with him. So where I was asleep... God then began to deal with me to strengthen me. One of the places in me, which when I first came into the church, was witnessing. Being a witness. A lot of us will not witness. 
Somehow we kind of take a, a seat back and let the pastor do it or let somebody else do it, but not me. Well, there was one night when my pastor was preaching and he was on about the miracles of God and, and I'm sitting there and I thought, you know what, I'm going to try this. I'm going to get my pastors in the East Coast. He's a, a man called Chester Wright. He's quite a profound preacher and he was preaching with some gusto that night and I was like, I'm going to try this. If the miracles happened 2,000 years ago and he's saying they still, now I was brand new. And he still, still says that they are happening today. Well, I want to see them. I want to try this. Well, my pastor was quite a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, a military man. Yeah. Don't take any nonsense. So I said, hey, pastor, I want to go for it. I want to try this. Well, go off and come back and tell me what's happened. So then in my little mind, I'm like, you know, I'm going to try and witness to people. Now, I'm brand new. But I also owned a construction company. I used to build custom homes. So I went to the job. After I got the Holy Ghost with no knowledge of the Bible, no knowledge of things of God, I knew zero, I went to the job site. Now, I owned, I owned the company, and I would go on the job site, and I'd turn the generators off, and I'd go, all right, shut up and sit down. I'm going to preach to you. <laughs> it was awesome because they knew me well. They knew what I was like, like the week before, but all of a sudden, I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I got the Holy Ghost. And these guys go, you can't. And I said, hey, I'm paying you. Turn it off. I'm going to talk to you. And it was awesome because these men actually would turn the generators off and shut up, sit down, and listen. So then I really started to use manipulation, I suppose. <laughs> but... He, he, any, any tool, any evangelism tool I found, I would use it. And then it got to the place where I'm going to teach you a Bible study tonight. You're coming to my house. I'm not doing that. Do you want to get paid on Friday? <laughs> if you want to get paid on Friday, you come to my I'm, I'll be at, 10, at 7 o'clock till 8, 9, 10 o'clock, whatever. But you come to my house because if you want to get paid, you better get there. <laughs> you can't do that. Well, you ain't getting paid then. <laughs> do you know what's amazing, Pastor? I baptized, I baptized two carpentry crews, electricians, painters, you name it. All they were doing was coming to my house and sitting down in my basement. Now, my poor wife has not yet, she was still with the Roman church. There's me going to, they used to call me John the Baptist at the church eventually because I, started, I had my own church rows at the back. I mean, I just, I'm promising you this, it was where I was asleep. I was, it was a weakness, but God began to turn that weakness into a pillar. I began to step out like never before. And one of my, one of my men, and I, I love him dearly, Tony, he came to my site one day in an old beat-up truck, and he said, I, I want to move all your, all your construction trash. And I'm like, okay, and you know, I'll give you a go. And I, I, he began to work for us. And then I had an idea. <laughs> He comes to my house on Friday night and he went, hey man, he got my check. And I'm like, um, I haven't got my checkbook. Now, I was being a bit of a Jacob because it wasn't on me personally. <laughs> it was in my truck. And he go, well, I want my money. I said, tell you what, come to Antioch, the Apostolic Church, 10 o'clock Sunday morning and I'll give you your check. So Tony, I knew he'd be there. 10 o'clock, I tell my ushers, I go in and get right. Look, 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 there's a black fella coming in. Got green eyes, good looking fella. You can't miss him. He's looking for me. Send him to me. So I used to sit roughly where you are there. And this guy walks in. The organ's going, church is going crazy. And up comes Tony and he stands next to me and he nudges me and he went, he got my money. And I'm like, Tony, this is the house of God. We don't do business in here. Raise your hands and worship God. So Tony, the good Methodist go. So I'm thinking, wow, this is awesome. So then, ah, pastor, I shouldn't have done this. But he's been in the church for the last 30, gosh, 29 years. He said, can I have my check? After the service, and I went, oh. I haven't got my checkbook. Oh, come on, man. I said, 
Six o'clock tonight, I promise you. I'll come to church tonight at six o'clock. <laughs> and he went, really? I said, honestly, I will have the, I'll take the checkbook in to the church. Tony, six o'clock, comes into the church. Worship's going. He nudges me. <laughs> Tony, you can't do business in the house of God. <laughs> Lift your hands and worship God with me. But well, listen, so he did. And I'm thinking, right, I've been following my pastor around for about, a, about eight months. And I was watching the way he prayed for people. This is my pillow about to become my pillar. And I'm like, oh. he, he lays his hands upon his head. What's that? And I've listened to what he says. Open your heart to God and God will baptize you with the whole. So I thought, I'll give this a go. So I stand there and Tony's got his hands up. So I lay my hands upon him and my God. God, that man was filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, that blew my little brain because that's the first person I'd ever prayed for to receive the Holy Ghost. But what it was, let me go back to my weakness. I let everybody else do the witnessing, not me. Anybody struggle witnessing? You've been asleep on it. And God's trying to take that place where you've been sleeping into a place where it will be your strongest part of your war with him. Tony today, Tony today has brought God knows how many people into our church in Maryland. But that man, that was my, that was my wake-up call. I've been asleep. I was letting the, the other preachers or the whomsoever of the church bring people to church, but not me. But I was like, wow, I could feel that God was trying to get me to take my weak part of my walk with him and turn it into my strongest part with him. Tony called me. I was preaching up in Canada and Tony called me and he was crying his eyes out. And this is within months of him receiving the Holy Ghost. And he was like, John, where are you? I said, I'm up in Toronto. I'm preaching. And he said, my whole family, there's 14 of my family standing at the baptismal tank. Thank God that you, that you, you manipulated me and brought me to the church. But all of my family are getting baptized right now. Mom and dad and brothers and sisters and the children. It's awesome. But that was my weakness, and God turned that pillow into a pillar. Well, then he goes into another realm, and I'm like, oh, God, the miraculous. We are God's vessels. Mark 16, 16 said, if you believe and are baptized, you'll be saved. If you believe not, you'll be condemned. And though these signs will follow those that believe, you will Cast out devils in my name, take, uh, uh, talk in new tongues, take up anything deadly, won't harm you, and lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. So there's me going, well, everybody else can do that. Until God goes, that weakness, I'm going to turn into a strength. That pillow where you are asleep, I'm going to use you. I'm going to show you that that weakness can be, again, one of the strongest parts of your walk with me. I began to pray for people, and I began to see different diseases, different issues, different problems in people, leaving them. I mean, gone, cancers. We've got actual doctor reports showing that the people that we had prayed for, and I'm going, God, this is incredible. How could you use me? Because I was asleep on it. And he said, I'm going to turn your weakness into a strength. So here I am in England. Trained for 11 years in Maryland. To, to, I didn't, it never was I going to be a missionary or whatever, ever. Or a preacher. But somebody, somehow God had a different idea. When I said no, he said yes. And thank God we said yes. But I came to a place one day that God, I was saying, God, I want to see more. Not this more. He answered my question from all those years ago. <laughs> and I baptized an older gentleman, really early years when we got to England. I baptized this old man, and, and, an older man. He was a lovely fellow. He would come and stand. His, there was only eight ladies in the building when we got there. And over the years, and thank God, we've baptized hundreds now. But these eight ladies had, had stood at that place. And it was an old, smelly little building. And there was mushrooms on the walls. The floors were rotten. Stunk a damp. Today, you'd be blown away what it looks like today. Thank God. But I baptized him. I, I asked him a question. 
And, and, and he used to come, and I went to his house one morning, and I'm like, Stan, you're getting older, fella. And I just had this feeling to ask him, if anything happens to you, they're probably going to ask me to do your funeral. Because I found out he had an aneurysm, and he was like, just tell him I was a nice guy. I said, no, I, I, this is what I want to tell him, that I baptized you personally, and I prayed you through to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what I want to be able to say. And he looked at me, and he was like, well, I'll, I'll think about it. Well, that week, he came, uh, his wife came on a Thursday night and said, will you baptize Stan on Sunday morning? I said, okay, baptize Stan. That Tuesday, Wednesday of that following week, his aneurysm burst and he had a heart attack at the same time. I get a phone call saying, Pastor, please come to the church. He's going to die. Oh, come to the church. Come to the hospital. He's about to die. I get to the hospital. I see the, the, the doctor. The doctor's walking away from his bed. He's got blood coming down his face. His family are outside. Everyone's crying. I mean, I'm standing next to him, and I said, Doc, what is it? And he said, follow me. And I followed him outside into the corridor, and he went, look, the aneurysm has burst. He's, he's just filling in, in his body with blood. He's, have, he's having a heart attack. I can't touch the heart because of the aneurysm. I can't touch the aneurysm because of the heart. He's got about two minutes left. So please tell the family that say goodbye to the grandfather and to the father. And I said this, I'm like, well, that's your opinion. And he went, he said, I'm going to go and pray for him. Oh, oh my God, here we go. Here's my pillow, going to be turned into a pillar. And I walk in, and the curtains are closed, and she's laid in flat, and that little beepy thing, whatever that monitor is called, I don't know, it was going boo. He was gone as you would say. <laughs> and I, I asked the nurse, I said, can, can I just get in there? And I asked her to move out the way, and she went, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to pray. Pray? I said, yes, I'm going to pray. Oh, God, here we go. I walked up to Stan, lying there, the blood, of the, the, the flat line, and I lay my hands upon his chest. And all my brain is doing is this. God, you said if we lay hands upon the dead they will rise again. Oh, God. I lay my hands upon Stan's chest, and it wasn't no crazy prayer. It was, Jesus, in your great name, I pray. I speak life back into Stan's body. Well, well. <laughs> and then Stan opened his eyes, freaked the fire out of me. I jumped back about 15 feet Go out of the curtain, went, oh my God. And I went, I went ooh, that was good. Oh. <laughs> and I went back in and I went, Stan. And he went, whoa, you've just prayed for me. I said, yes, I did. <laughs> and he went, this is nuts, but this is the reality of it. He said, I was standing with Jesus Christ. And we heard you say his name. And he sent me back. And I opened my eyes and you're standing right in front of me. I was like, oh my goodness, oh my God. And I went, well, that's what's supposed to happen. And I stood there and I went, hey, hey, nope. family, come and say hello to granddad. He's still alive. Family, come and say hello to father. He's still with us. The nurse called the doctor and she was like, doc, come back. The man's alive. And he was like, what? He comes flying back. I'm going out the hospital. He's up there. They called me and said the heart actually never showed a sign of a heart attack. And they took him straight down to theater and they took care of his aneurysm. God turned my weakness into my strength. My pillow that I was asleep on became one of my strongest parts of my walk with God. The Lord made, now this it gets better because once you get the taste of it, once you step out and try it, oh my God, it's awesome. Then I, I'm like, anywhere I go, I just long to pray for everybody because I've seen it with my own eyes and all of a sudden I've got this zeal to pray for everything and everybody. Didn't matter where, doesn't matter how. Then the Lord Mayor of the city come to us. He knew me from our youth initiative and he came and he called me and he got to know us over a period of about three years and he called me and he said, Rev, I've got a problem. And the Lord showed me he got cancer. 
I said, I'm, I'm at the church, Hugh. And he said, Rev, I gotta, you're the only man I want to talk to. And I want to come and see you. I said, okay. And the Lord said, he, he's, he's a mess. And he comes, and we hadn't even built the new church. But it was all the old building stuff. And I had a little tiny office about as big as that area right there. And I'm sitting in there, and in comes the ex-Lord Mayor. And he sits down in front of me, and he weeps. He breaks down. And I'm like, Hugh? And he went, Rev, what's it like to die? I said, well, <laughs> I ain't got a clue. I said, I'm still breathing right now. I said, but the one I've been telling you about that died and rose again, that's the one I'm going to continue to tell you about. And he went, I've been given three months to live. I've got stage four melanoma cancer. It's in all in my body. And he said, I've got two to three months to live. And then he broke down again. And then all of a sudden, I looked at him. I went, you are not going to die of that disease. He looked at me and he went to say to me, how on earth can you? And all of a sudden, this man leaps in the air. I mean, leaps. I mean, he's sitting there weeping. And now he's jumping up and down like a raving lunatic, shouting at me, going, something has just left my body. Something's come out of me. When well, my wife comes into the room and he grabs hold of Sherry and he's dancing with my wife, bouncing her around the room. And I'm just going, what on earth is going on in here? And I'm going, I don't know, but he just said something's come out of his body. He runs literally out of the building. I, I don't even know where he went. Two days later, I get a phone call. And I'm building the back of the church, an extension on the kitchen. I got my yellow boots on. I got concrete being poured between my legs. And my phone's ringing. And one of the young men that's helping me picks the phone up. He's like, Pastor, it's you. I said, tell him I'll call him back. And he went, I am not going to tell him. He is telling me right now to put you on the phone. So I get the phone and go, Hugh. And he goes, Rev, I'm at the oncologist's. He's sending me home to live. He said, they cannot find the stage four melanoma cancer anywhere in my body. God took a weakness and began to turn it into a strength. I've got so many stories, Pastor Moore, about the healing that God has been using myself and my wife. It was something that was a weakness has now become a strength. So when somebody says, I'm not well, well what am I going to do? I'm going to walk up and pray. No, you're fine today in Jesus' name because my weakness was not using it and it became a strength once I tried it. God was bringing me, and I'm telling you this for a purpose. That's what he's trying to do here. He's trying to get you out of that place where you're so used to the pillow. This is the pillow. The church seats become very comfortable. And the world around of us is dying. And it's lost. It needs the voice of the church like it's never heard it raised before. It needs to see the miraculous of the church like it's never seen it before. You are the missionaries to Longview. I'm looking at the mission field. I am looking at the missionaries. This is your calling to be here at Longview to take this gospel out onto these streets. You have the miraculous at your fingertips and upon your lips. You can walk around these neighborhoods wherever you may be and let God turn your pillow that you've been sleeping on and turn it into the pillar that God honestly will use you like you could never imagine. Only all you've got to do is step out and try it. That pillow then becomes a pillar. And here I am, this, this, I wasn't a witness, but my God, I've become a witnessing maniac. I did. I mean, to get your general license in Maryland, my pastor is a general, the, the, the district superintendent, and we have a criteria that you have to have people on the seats before the sign for your local license. You're going to have people that you baptize on the seats, and you're going to be teaching them Bible studies, and then you get your general license, and you're going to have even more again. And I mean, oh my God, more again, you're everywhere you are. He said, you're going to have even more people. So here I am. I go to get my general license. This is back in 1998. I wasn't even thinking about missions and nothing. 
And then I went to get my, my, my license application filled out by my pastor. And he, he, he said, I want to see the evangelism record. You know what I'm like. I'm not going to sign nothing. When I laid it down in one year, we'd baptized 138 people. That was in one year. And he went, oh, my gosh. I said, Pastor, will you sign that for me? Some of them guys only get one person. I had 138. And I'm, I'm, but it was because I tried it. All of a sudden, I'm preaching in Washington and in Virginia and up in Canada. I was going all over the place, still working, still had my business, but I could see what had happened to me. I began to try. Because when I was asleep, God woke me up and turned those pillows into pillars. The strongest part of my walk with God was what my weakest parts were. Am I making any sense? And I could give you hours and hours and hours of incidences in the miraculous. That's nothing to do with patting a human being on the back. That is looking at God going, you can use this. You, you, you honestly can use a lying ex-builder that would do anything to get the wage at the end of the week, that type of person. Anybody in the, in the building industry in here? We're just a bunch of lying, lying thieves, really, aren't we? <laughs> Woo! Oh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Isn't it true? No. Well, I was the only honest builder I've ever met. I'm going to leave that there. Thank you. So I... I uh, he's gonna, you're going gonna to still love me, you know that. Don't you? And God brought me out of the construction world into the full-time mission, so... I really do know what I'm saying. So I got to a point in life that I was praying. One day, God, use me, talk to me, lead me, guide me. And I used to pray for my family. My family were in England, and I was in Annapolis, Maryland. And as I'm praying, I would be like, God, I used to call out my family's names, call out Mark and Paul and my, my sister and their children and my mother while she, before she passed away. And then it would come to my father and I would go, and don't forget him. My dad was a tough man. Dad was a really tough man. He was a street fighter, ex-builder, ex-boxer. He grew up in the war. He was abused in an orphanage when they, his, his own brother died in his arms and he ran away from the situation and they put him into an orphanage with all the children that uh, the parents had died in the war and they put... It was just an absolute mess, dysfunctional people like you wouldn't believe. My dad was about 11 and they put him in a home in an orphanage where they abused all the children. So it wasn't until years later that I realized why my dad couldn't love us. He didn't know how to love us. He didn't know how to show love. All he knew how to do was correct us and keep us that way. And we kind of lived in a little bit of fear of him. But it's the way he was raised. So I was praying one evening. And I felt the Lord just come alongside of me and ask me a question. Why are you in my kingdom? And I stopped I knew what I'd heard. I'm not crazy. I mean, because I prayed. And what was that prayer? When my son, Matthew, was two years of age, I put him to bed. And I looked to heaven and I went, God, if you're real, I can't be a father to my son like my father was to me. Wherever you are, take me there and I will never leave. I had never prayed a prayer in my life. I was 29 years of age. Within weeks, I was at a timber yard, a lumber yard, and a man walked up next to me and said to the man behind the counter, I need a good builder for a picky customer. And young Mike went, he's one of our best builders, take him with you. I met a man that day called Daryl Savage. Daryl, a Jewish gentleman, was a born-again Christian. I had a wrangling match to renovate this man's home. I got the job, and I began to do the work. If you go on John Hema's testimony, I'm not going to go through my testimony. Watch that this evening before you go to sleep. You won't sleep all night. <laughs> but I ended up at this church, filled with the Holy Ghost within weeks, baptized within a couple of months, 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins, and there was many. And when I realized that one day that when God asked me, how did I get to where I was? It was because I prayed about my father. You talk about taking a weakness of bitterness and anger and unforgiveness to a human being. Now, I was also a preacher now, I've been a licensed minister, but I didn't realize how much I was harboring as those years gone by. God was taking probably my weakest part of my whole walk with Him and about to turn it into the strongest. As I prayed, and I began to say, God, the only reason I'm in your kingdom is because of the way my father treated me. And I began to weep. And I went, God, thank you for my father. I had never in a million years would I ever, ever thought that would have come out of my lips. But I began to thank him and say, God, thank you for the way my father treated me. Because if he hadn't have been that way towards me, I would not be praying to you today. I wouldn't even know who you were. I began to worship God and thank God for my father the way my father was to me. He was, he was an angry man and he, he showed it in many ways. But I didn't realize until I began to ask God, whatever's in me. Show me and take it from me. And that was one thing that I never, ever, ever thought about until that night. And then when I began to thank God for that man, that, that man that hurt me more than anybody else had ever, ever in my life done, I began to thank God for him. Every one of us are in this building this evening. Because somewhere down the line, we've got people or situations that hurt us. And when we came into the kingdom, the kingdom was our opening to the peace and the love and the joy and that forgiveness that we wanted from him. But God had to show me his forgiveness to me. And then I had to show forgiveness to the one that hurt me the most. So I'm not here just to talk about me. I'm also here to speak to a congregation about, let's go back to the original point why most of us are in the kingdom today. Because somewhere in our life, there was a time and a place where we were injured and wounded by this world. doesn't matter who by or what by. How many of us still carry the bitterness and those places and those times when we have a thought about that person or a thought about that place and that, that burning once more, that, 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 that trepidation is still there. That's what God took me to. He took me to my weakness and said, I'm going to show you how to turn that weakness into the strength that you need. And I'm going to ask this evening, I want to go back up to the pulpit. There's a stairs over here. How on earth will we get up there? There you go. <laughs> I want to ask the congregation, Pastor, can we have a, an altar call this evening? Yes, Musicians, any musician, any keyboard player, want to come up here for one second? I want to use this. I've just opened my heart completely to every single one of you here. I didn't speak about anybody in particular. I spoke about myself. I literally became so vulnerable and open to tell you where I have come from to get where I am this evening. But I also know when I come into a congregation like this that I know that our people, that somewhere deep down in that, in that life of ours, we begin to forget why we are in the house of God. Those years, and we don't recognize that there are still those things that still niggle at us. Anybody suffer with outbursts of anger? It's still unresolved inside of your heart, and you know who I'm talking to because a lot of us have that issue. We'll have an unresolved issue, and it usually is what somebody has done. It's the unforgiveness, the bitterness that we carry. And I promise you, that angels ascending and descending into this building this evening. 
and they are here for a purpose. God is overseeing what we are doing. He is watching and he is listening. And here tonight is the gate to heaven. If you need anything from God, here is the place you're going to get it. Would you stand with me this evening? Would you lift up your hearts in this building tonight? Would you come out of your seats and even come to an altar, an altar where you can ask God, God, this is the gate to heaven. This is where I need to be. This is where I know, God, I carry the burdens of my life. I carry the burdens of my past. I need, God, once more, this is the gate to heaven. And this is where the angels are ascending and descending. God, help every single one of us in this building today. Let this be a day where God turns those weaknesses of ours into strengths. This is where the strength of God comes from. When we begin to give unto Him the heaviness, the burdens of life. When we really start to look back at why we are in His kingdom. What somebody did to me or what somebody said to me a long time ago, that's what brought me into the church, into God's kingdom. A broken heart, a broken man began to pray to God that he didn't even know. God, I cannot carry this anymore. I need to be healed of it, God. I need to release that bitterness. And tonight, this is the gate to heaven. Every one of us. Our heart as the angels are ascending and descending in the building. Let God take out of us what God needs to take out of us. Let Him relieve us of all those years of of the burdens of life and the pain and the sorrows that sometimes just rears its ugly head. It's because we've never let it go. But tonight we are in here. Here is the gate. The angels are here waiting to take those burdens. Jesus said this, cast your burdens upon me for I care for you. Father, just like you did for me, bring me to that point where the guilt of my life and the shame of life completely was eradicated because I saw your word and I understood that the pain that I carried and the hurts of life that I carried, I hid them very well, Jesus. I put a smile on my face but I hid them really well. But God, you knew they were still there. You knew there was a depth to my life that I was prepared to let anybody ever see again. But because you loved me and because you knew that was a, an effect in my life that you began to deal with me and bring me to that point and turn my weakness into a strength. Come on, church, let's go. Let's dig a little bit deeper. 